and we're recording now. Cool. Alrighty, so we talked about the first uh, two parts of the pre recitation. Um, and or we're talking about those now. And um, the first one's just about acidity. So that's this cardio stuff. I'm going to review that um, because it's super important. Um, and really, it all integrates together um, with, you know, from gen chem and um, biochemistry, um, and then also organic chemistry. So all this is where all those like classes kind of combine. It's important you have like an understanding of how all these kind of concepts mesh. And then the second part, I thought the second part of this first pre recitation um, of this pre recitation is a lot harder than like the challenge problems. Um, partially just because there's something that Nichols talked about that the blue didn't, um, and you really need to have a grasp of that to do well on it. But anywho, um, so this first one is just induction. So if you didn't notice, um, basically there's an extra spacer carbon in this second one, and that, that's not there in the first one. Um, and so basically the there will be a stronger induction force um, on the first one. So I'm going to talk about cardio real quick. Um, so remember cardio specifically has to do with like a criteria to make um, that you kind of evaluate molecules on to see how like acidic they are. And so the way it works is like if they meet all the criteria up here, these criteria are weighted more heavily than the cr criteria down here. Um, and then you need to remember that this is like positive charge. And so as you get into biochemistry, um, you start to this this concept of like low pH positive charge um, of electrophilicity, all of these concepts kind of start to like mesh. And that's because like they basically all correspond to just like electron deficiency. Um, and so when you have a positive charge, that means you're like so electron deficient that like, you know, there's a whole system of um, evaluating that, that, you know, have agreed that this is like very, very positive enough to where it's a unit. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, um, positive charge means it's very um, acidic. Um, and then we go on to, so let's see, the A is just atom. So acidity increases when you increase basically like um, the um, ultranegativity and the size of the atom. And so um, if you have an atom that's very, very big, you can think of it as um, it's like its shells are, are softer. Um, and so the outer cells, shells of its electrons are going to be, um, have less, um, let's see how I could describe this. Um, think of it as the very core of the atom has very much negative charge, um, is very strongly negatively charged um, because you know that's where you've got your electrons most closely um, compacted um, to, you know, go against the nucleus. Um, and so when you've got like larger molecules like bromine, basically protons will come in those in that electrons orbitals and the protons will be a lot um, further away from like the negative charge of um, the atom. And so ultimately that makes those protons easier to pluck away. Um, so size means that, you know, um, you're more acidic um, when you're bigger in size. Also, electronegativity increases the likelihood that it's going to be an acidic atom um, or an atom that will make a better acid. Um, so if you've got um, an atom like, for example, like fluorine, bromine, um, chlorine, things like that, those atoms all have strong electronegativity because they, they want to fill their electron orbitals. They're almost full um, of that last p orbital. And so basically, they're, just, they're very electronegative. Um, and so what you need to know from that is that like, basically they're gonna be more likely to hold electrons. Um, and when they pull electrons away and specifically to themselves, that means that there's less electrons available to cater to specifically that proton. Um, and so that's kind of like a common concept throughout as we go into resonance and dipole um, is like, if there's not electrons available to like cater to that proton, um, basically it'll be easier to pluck that proton off. Um, so we talk about resonance and that's basically just like when you've got delocalized electrons. And so when electrons are delocalized, um, you could think of it as the electrons are not always there on that specific atom. Sometimes they're delocalized off to another atom. Um, and when they're far away, um, it means that basically that proton is very easy to pop off. Um, and so, yeah, that's resonance. The bigger pi system you have, the more resonance you have, um, the more easily um, like 
popped off that proton is. And the more acidic it'll be, the better acid it'll be. And so that actually co like correlates to, you know, if you have a more stable conjugate base, um, it's gonna be a better acid. Um, and I'm harping all this because like, it's covered in the ACS like quite a bit. Um, and it's something that if you understand that, it's a very like, you know, recurrent theme. Um, induction just refers to like, basically, um, like I talked about with resonance, how electrons will be, you know, moving throughout a pi system. Um, and when they're not specifically there to cater to that proton, um, the proton is more likely to be plucked off. Um, induction specifically means that like there's a lo enough electronegativity that electron density is pulled away from the proton. And so those electrons are once again less likely to be specifically there to cater to the proton. I know I'm repeating myself with a lot of this, but like these are all very, you know, integral topics and they kind of overlap a lot. Um, so last thing, we just have orbitals. And so basically when you have an increased S character, it just means that like basically the electrons are going to be a lot more um, like catered to a specific area and they're in just like a little bubble. Whereas like, you know, you've got D and P orbitals, um, really we just do P orbitals when we've got organic chemistry. Um, but those P orbitals um, are a lot larger. And so the electron density is scattered out over a larger space. And that means that like, basically it's easier for those protons to be plucked off again because your electrons are not always gonna be directly like right there with the, um, the proton. And I don't think I explained that very well, um, but Basically, like if you've got something that's S, um, electrons are going to be in that S shell and they're not going to be available in the P shell to, you know, um, hold a proton. Does that make sense? Okay. Can you explain the charge one again? Just the remember meeting higher criteria. Yeah. So if it's charged, if it's like got a full blown positive charge, that means like, for example, it's like this atom here. And so this is or for example, this guy. Um, oh, it can just give a proton easier. Okay, that exactly. Sense. So like this oxygen is so like, got its electrons spread so far and so thin that like it's got a positive charge. It's not happy. Um, and yeah, it really would rather have its electrons directly with the oxygen. And it's so unhappy that it gives itself a positive charge. Anything else? Y'all got this? Cool. I know I talked about this for a long time, but it's an important thing. Um, the next thing we got resonance, and then also you could call this induction and S character stuff, um, because you've got, in one way, you've got, you know, the electrons bouncing around the oxygens here, that's on both molecules. Um, but you've also got resonance in that these electrons out here could bounce around into this um, alkyne. Um, and then also that's like S character here. Um, and then also that's induction. So um, this right here, all the electrons are going to in, be induced to be, it's going to pull electrons from over here to right there. Um, so that's, that's that second one. Um, next one over here, we've got resonance. Um, it's pretty obvious, hopefully, you know, you've got a pi system, electrons aren't going to be participating in that. Um, and it'll pull density away from the carboxylic acid and ultimately allow this hydrogen to be plucked off pretty easily. Um, Next, we've got this last one. So this one um, is uh, the second one because of specifically because of induction. Um, so you kind of got two like factors at odds here. And this one, I feel like you could make an argument that it's this, but data does not support that it's that one. Um, because obviously you've got more resonance in the first molecule. Um, but what's important here is there is a ton of induction going on from all these fluorines that are pulling electron density out into the ring. And so when you've got this huge like benzene ring here, um, it kind of works as like a like buffering between, um, you know, the really electron withdrawing um, components of the ring and the actual carboxylic acid. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, basically when you've got all the induction forces right here going into this ring, um, right next to the acid, uh, electrons on this, these oxygens are going to be much more likely to be out here in the ring um, than they would be on this one where you've got a bigger pi system. Um, does that make sense? 
I think that was kind of the hardest one. Um, and then this last one is just induction. And so hopefully that's, you really, that should be like really easily understood if you understood this one, because I thought that one was a lot harder and, you know, calls into um, action a lot more concepts. So this one over here, I thought this was really hard at first because Valu hasn't talked about this mechanism right here. Um, so if you add a ton of BRs um, to a molecule, basically the BRs will all add out here. Um, and so they'll replace the hydrogens with BR. Um, and so when that happens, eventually it will just allow this like carbon to just pop off. Um, and then, you know, you've got a nucleophile here that will punch it. And so I guess it's probably, you know, the um, hydroxyl is working as a nucleophile and it just substitutes off um, that big old thing here. Um, so yeah, that's all that, that's happening here. Um, and that's a reaction that, you know, Valu hasn't talked about, I don't remember it, but uh, that's, we talk about it in the old West station, that's how that works. Um, the second one here is, is something that hopefully you guys are really comfortable with this. This is, if you understand this, it's the entire challenge problems. Um, basically first you're just, um, you know, brominating and um, using some radiation there or UV light, actually not radiation. Um, then uh, you've just got your Grignard reagent and um, carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is a great way to just um, add to a Grignard and plop on a, um, you know, carboxylic acid. Um, any questions so far? No? Cool. Um, Put up just a little bit. Uh, yeah. I had that one wrong. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. For sure. Um, okay, so for this third one, um, all we're, it's once again doing basically the same thing that we did and this one, except for, you know, the way we're getting our BR is a little bit different. Um, so we have to swap it off with a PBR. Um, and so when we do that, um, it's going to invert the stereochemistry, put a BR on there. And then you can just do your um, Grignard reagent with, carboxylic, with um, carbon dioxide to make carboxylic acid. Um, that should be a positive charge there. Could you have used SOCl2? Say and then could you use uh, SOCl2 and then KCN and then H3O plus? SOCl2 and then what else? Sorry, I didn't hear you. KCN and then H, uh, H3O plus? Yes. Yes, that is a valid way of doing that. Could you have started off with HBr? Um, yes. Let me check. So I don't know if I went to use HBr. Well, yeah, you could have, um, because that would just be an SN1. So yeah, that's good thinking. Um, anything else? Um, so we hadn't talked about tolerance a ton, but, um, you can use tolerance for this, this, um, fourth one. Uh, really I would just stick to chromic acid because that's what's comfortable for me. Um, but yeah, tolerance will take stuff from aldehyde to carboxylic acid. Um, but really for synthesis, I'd stick to chromic acid. Um, same thing for this last one, uh, or this fifth one, chromic acid is the way to go, in my opinion. Um, cool. And hopefully you guys understand. Remember, chromic acid is the really strong bad boy. Um, he's a heavy oxidizer. And then that leaves this one. This one, once again, I thought was kind of difficult um, because I wasn't comfortable with this step um, here. But if you understand that, basically, you can, you know, reverse... Um, Enamines pretty easily, or imines, um, pretty easily with just water. 
um, you can take this one back to a ketone and then from a ketone, um, all you've got to do is uh, this bad boy step where, you know, that puts all the BRs out here. Um, and then you get like an SN2 reaction or something like that um, with this bad boy attacking right here. Um, does that make sense? Cool. All right, last one. Um, I started with ozonolysis uh, and then isolated like the highlighted product. Really all you've got to do is get um, this isolated product um, because then, you know, you can do the same thing again. Um, and so that's just once again, reinforcing that like this is an important mechanism that you need to re like recognize, um, you know, oh, I've got like a secondary, a carbon like that's second from the end. Um, I can do a lot with adding BR and um, hydroxyl to or hydroxide. Yeah, do y'all get it? I know there's a lot of silence and kind of awkward here. At least it's not like a dark abyss. I'm just sitting here. That's always like kind of depressing. Um, okay, I'm moving on. <laughs> um, so for this this challenge problems, I thought they were a lot easier than the ones that we've been having. Um, if you were able to do everything on the pre recitation, challenge problem shouldn't be should be a piece of cake. Um, this we're doing a little bit different with group assignments, um, but I'm here and I'll be bouncing in or in and around. Oh, I should pause the recording now. All right. So, oh crap, I didn't screen share. Okay, I think it's recording. Okay, so everybody else is left now, and I'm just going to go over the rest of the key. Um, so this first challenge problem really was just a matter of recognizing that you're adding a single carbon, and um, you know it's fully oxidized to a carboxylic acid. Um, and so there's a few ways to do this. Um, probably the easiest is just to use Grignard, um, Grignard and um, carbon dioxide. Um, and so you'll want to use uh, PBR to make uh, that hydroxyl into a um, BR. And then um, by dropping the magnesium into ether, you form the Grignard reagent. And then um, basically that um, carbon dioxide is just going to become the uh, carboxylic acid. Uh, you could also do um, the thiochloride thing. Um, so CO or SO Cl2. Um, and then with that, you're going to want to use cyanide. Um, so like potassium cyanide. And a lot of times you use that in um, just aqueous solution, but you could also do it um, in ethanol. That's probably the more common used um, solvent. I think it would work better with that now that I think about it. Um, I think that's also what she teaches you to use. Um, and then you'll just use uh, water and acid. And by doing that, um, it takes basically the way I think of it is um, every, you know, bond that's bonded to a carbon um, from the nitrogen, when you add like water to that um, and acid, excuse me, um, those bonds all get oxidized or they get turned into carbon oxygen bonds. And so, you know, you'll go from cyanide um, to a carboxylic acid. And so this next one, we're just looking at Grignard um, again. So once again, um, you see that you're adding um, one carbon and that one carbon has a um, carboxylic acid. Whenever you see that, you should automatically just think like, oh, Grignard with carbox or um, carbon dioxide. So we're going to start out by adding an anti Mikovnikov um, BR. And so you could also use like uh, BH3 and uh, I think it's like HBR. Um, and that'll work as well, I think. But really just stick to um, 
using a peroxide. Anyway, so once you've done that, you're going to want to form your grin yard. Same thing we've been doing. Um, and yeah, that's a pretty straightforward one. Um, next one, it's the exact same thing, only we need to add it to Markovnikov carbon. Um, so to do that, we're going to do HBr, and then we're just going to do the same thing we've been doing um, with um, creating a grin yard from that and then using carbon dioxide. Um, yeah. Uh, this last one is probably the hardest simply because you need to use a music note, um, or that's what I like to call it. Um, ethylene glycol. Um, that's right. Um, anyway, what that does is it protects the um, ketone here. Um, and so hopefully these were pretty simple. Um, but when you get down to this, the thing that you need to re remember um, is that once again, you know, you're adding a carboxylic acid, but this time um, they're basically making sure that you remember that you have to protect Grignards um, or protect ketones um, from Grignards. Grignards will, uh, if you add a Grignard directly to this, uh, it'll attack here and then it'll also attack here. Um, and so nobody wants that. Um, that just makes a mess. Um, and yeah. So don't do that. Don't use ketones and or aldehydes with Grignards um, unless like you specifically want that reaction because um, it'll get messy. And yeah, that's pretty much all there is. Remember that you use acid to equip the ethylene glycol and you use water to um, water and acid to equip um, the uh, Grignard or to do the acid workup for the Grignard um, and to remove remove both of them. So water removes ethylene glycol, acid actually adds it. And not water and acid, just acid. Um, yeah. Um, so that's that. I think that's pretty much it for this presentation. Um, hope this was helpful. Please like and subscribe. Just kidding, don't do that. Um, cool, that's it.